from New York City for our viewers worldwide. I'm Manus Cranny in for Jonathan Farrow. Equity markets showing a peak of green. They're holding on for the hero that is earnings from tech. The countdown to the open starts right now. Everything you need to get set for the start of U.S. trading. This is Bloomberg The Open with Jonathan Farrow. The show stops flirt with another record as the earnings season starts to heat up. China considers a $278 billion rescue package and its GOP showdown in New Hampshire with Trump versus Haiti. We begin with a big issue. Attention turning to tech. It's all about earnings at the moment. Tech earnings are supposed to be up in, in double digits. The tech sector has done very well last year. We had the big AI boom uh, pushing through earnings for tech stocks. What drove the market last year was that that magnificent seven. Tech stocks have been able to deliver. The bar has been set incredibly high. Expectations could be on the higher end, and that could be a risk. I am broadly positive. Earnings. Uh, expectation is likely to be justified. I still think they're going to be one of the fastest growing sectors. The enthusiasm for the Magnificent Seven will continue. The equity market is looking at the strength of earnings. Earnings deliver, markets can move a bit higher. And this is the most important earnings um, state that we've had in, in, a, in a very long time. Joining me now is Morgan Stanley's Mike Zezas and Winnie Cesar from Credit Insights. Tech, 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 tech. There's a frenzy. There really is uh, quite a frenzy in this market this morning. And we are now down to depending on tech to deliver. When you look at risk, to me, it feels like a coiled spring. Uh, Michael, you would say we've got to thread the needle and there's very little room for error. With that in mind, how important is the earnings in this part of the risk cycle? I think it's important, and listen, I think this is a really interesting time to be looking at tech and considering AI in the sense that there's about $6 trillion of market cap added last year uh, for what we call kind of AI enablers. And this is a year where kind of like the rubber should meet the road and we should be able to see if a lot of those use cases are um, actually going to add value. I mean, as it pertains to, to equity market impacts, though, and, and translating it back into fixed income i mean listen i think the, the equity market is already kind of priced in a lot of ways for this idea of a soft landing fixed income less so and so to us incrementally right, unless ai is driving this really really major uplift then i think a lot of the incremental opportunity our sort of more reliable return opportunity is going to be in fixed income this year. Okay, the flow, the flow from money markets into fixed income, and that is a narrative that's been building. Winnie, good morning to you. You said a good chunk of the performance has already been brought forward. It's been brought forward in the equity market, but it's been brought forward in the fixed income market. Are we richly priced on credit? Good morning to you as well, and thanks for having me. So we are actually at our year-end targets for both U.S. investment grade and high yield, and we really got there pretty much by the the end of 2023. So we pulled forward performance by almost a full year. Now, it is quite typical to see a lot of performance realized in the first few months of the year, and I think especially true this year when you do have a back half with political risk and the Fed risk and all sorts of different storms possibly brewing. I think that the expectation was to have a pretty good January, February, and then people sitting on their hands a bit more. But the fact that we realized so much performance really in November, December of last year has left a lot of people wondering kind of where do we go from here? And we've actually been recommending to clients that we should take a pause and be tactically a bit more cautious despite having a long-term constructive view on credit. OK, so I, I like that phrase, tactically cautious. Now, this is going to come down to the differential between what the market is pricing in cuts and what the Fed actually delivers. Let's just listen to Jan Hatzi as he weighed in on this very subject overnight in Hong Kong. The Fed is on its way to achieving uh, the soft landing. Obviously, no guarantees, but I like what I'm seeing. A March cut or cuts in general over the next few months under our forecast are somewhat optional. The economy is holding up, you know, pretty well. We don't think it's essential that they that they cut here, but it would be consistent with the signaling. 
So let's turn that into what you both think. Michael, um, one narrative that's been building through the morning with me, I had uh, Alberto Gallo at the start of the day at 5 a.m. He said, you're going to get a couple of insurance cuts, but you're not going to get dramatic slowdown cuts and the window closes because of politics after Labor Day. Do you think we're going to get insurance cuts or slowdown cuts? Michael. Well, listen, I mean, Arcom is thinking you're not going to get the first cut until June. But I think for fixed income investors, you got to take a step back here. And the big picture is that inflation's coming down. The Fed, the ECB, the BOE, uh, they're all sort of skewed towards cutting. The, really, the question is kind of when and what pace. That should be a really good backdrop for fixed income investors in general and then develop market government bonds in particular. And here, I think we flagged at the beginning of the year, we thought there was you know, 10% plus total returns in that cohort. We've gotten a lot of them already, but we think there's probably still five to 7% to go. And just based on the idea that soft landing or not, um, if central banks are cutting, maybe things in the short term aren't priced exactly the right way you want in terms of the probability of cuts in the near term. But over the next six to 12 months, we think the direction is pretty clear towards lower yields. OK, I mean, six, you know, five, six, seven percent uh, is still worth taking. Uh, Winnie, let's just close it off with you before I pivot to China. Uh, these rate cuts delayed to as late as June in your mind and then compressed. So we had been saying to expect the first rate cut in March, which back in October felt really risky. And then we were very surprised to see how materially the Fed pivot in messaging was in December. And I think that this really highlights one of the problems the Fed has with communications in that the market is going to very aggressively price in whatever policy path they're expecting, even if the Fed is not going to go that quickly. And that does result in a loosening of financial conditions, mm -hmm. which we've seen materialize over the past few weeks. And so now we're thinking that actually the probability of a March cut might be a little Little bit lower than what the market is pricing in. And we think that especially the upcoming January meeting, the messaging might be a little bit more hawkish, a little bit more disappointing, because in aggregate, at the headline level, the economic data have not really supported a potential okay. easing. But we do think a Fed cut comes in the first half of this year. They don't want to lose the wind that they've got from Waller and Bostick from last week. Uh, let's turn our attention to China. Bloomberg learning that Beijing is considering $278 billion package to stabilize its slumping equity market. Bloomberg's Mike McKee joins me now. So this is not a bazooka for the economy. This is a floor for equities, Mike. Well, at least that's what they're hoping. You're talking about the U.S. cutting rates in China. They have moved monetary policy, but it hasn't moved confidence. A picture is worth a thousand words or maybe a couple of trillion yuan here. You can see the CSI 300 and the Hang Seng. They have lost 10 uh, percent and six, almost 7 percent on the year, and that just builds on what they lost last year. It's been an elevator down for the uh, Chinese stock market. So people familiar are telling Bloomberg News that they are the Communist Party, at least, is planning a rescue package to put a floor under the market, 2 trillion yuan, as you said, $278 billion, from offshore state-owned enterprises, from cash they're keeping out of the country. Brad Setzer asks, why is that money out of the country? <laughs> they really want to bring it back, which is an interesting, unanswered question. But they would bring it back, buying onshore stocks through the Hong Kong Exchange Link. There is also a plan to spend 300 billion yuan, uh, $42 billion, from local funds. They'd buy onshore stocks through government investment funds, primarily through Shanghai. Uh, we also heard that regulators are guiding, in their words, insurance companies against short sales. Uh, is this going to work? Well, along with Brad Seth, there are a number of other people who think this is a questionable program. They point to 2015 when the Chinese government put money into the stock market. And as you can see there, stocks went up for a little bit. And then as soon as the stimulus went away, stocks went way down. They introduced a circuit breaker. That's the blue line there. And that really killed the market. So uh, given the fact that the U.S. now has sanctions on China, along with other countries, and the fact that the Chinese uh, economy is really struggling, the housing market's in bad shape, a lot of questions about whether this is actually going to do anything, maybe provide a floor, but maybe not. OK, uh, well, that is the debate for the equity market and the economy. Mike McKee uh, with the very latest on China. Mike and Winnie, um, 
look, it, it, it's very interesting. I arrive in this country, and we don't talk about China at all. The time zone shifts dramatically from the Middle East, London to the Middle East to here. It doesn't matter till it matters. This morning, it kind of matters, $300 billion to put a floor under the equity market, but it's not a bazooka for growth. What are the ramifications of what China does, the world's second biggest economy, to investing here? Mike. Yeah, I mean, listen, I think the, the, the mechanics of this particular move is still something that we're sorting through. But I think the big picture is that China growth is slowing. Um, China's uh, sort of shifted its economic strategy anyway in a way that you wouldn't necessarily rely on it to be this major engine of global growth anyway. And it's all part of a confluence of factors that's helping to drive down uh, the pace of inflation in developed markets. And, and I think feeds right back into the idea uh, that we could be getting good returns, i.e. lower yields over time this year uh, through most of the developed market world and government bonds. And for you, Winnie, I had one guest this morning that says China's uninvestable from a government bond point of view. Um, I don't think anybody out there, given the injuries they've had from equities to bonds, would disagree. Extrapolate the move this morning for global disinflation. So I think for global disinflation, we can, you know, pretty confidently say that the Chinese government is trying to kickstart their economy. They have had a lot of stimulative efforts in place. The big difference is that these stimulative efforts that we've seen over the past, call it six months, have not jump-started things like they have historically. And I think that that ultimately comes back down to the property markets. And when we're thinking about the path for global inflation, commodities are going to be a pretty key aspect and one that the Fed has less control over because there are supply side constraints there. So if we still have China kind of trundling along, not necessarily really ramping back up in growth, I do think that that is okay. pretty positive for the commodity side of things in terms of not going too overheated. You see, China does matter. It can make it into the conversation. It is relevant. Michael <laughs> sees us when he sees her. Stay with me. Uh, we've got more work to do. Let's look at what's going on under the hood. Abigail Doolittle is with me for the Movers and Shakers. Abby. Well, we are potentially looking at a fourth up day for the S&P 500 in a row. Very small gain at this point, but we have one big gainer into that open. United Airlines up 6.6% heading to, I believe, its best day of the year. Right now, they beat earnings by nearly 20%. Revenues they beat, too. They offered new guidance. That wasn't the massive profit slash that we saw out of Delta. In addition, growth is just right, not strong enough to that it can actually support fare hikes. DH, DR Horton, not so much, down nearly 5%. They posted weaker than expected new home orders. A look forward into uh, what people want to do in terms of buying homes, but also a look back on those 8% mortgages. The stock was up o over 65% over the last year, just not good enough, that those results. So, and then GE down 2.3%. Profits for this quarter of 60 to 65 cents, shy of the 70 cent estimate. All of this, of course, ahead of the breakup. They are spinning out their aerospace and energy businesses uh, later this year in a bid for a multi year turnaround. Okay, Abby, thank you very much. Come fly the friendly skies. Obviously, it worked for United. Coming up, GOP presidential hopeful Nikki Haley is getting ready for her make or break moment in New Hampshire. Republicans have lost the last seven out of eight popular votes for president. That is nothing to be proud of. We should want to win the majority of Americans. But the only way we're going to do that is if we elect a new generational conservative leader. We head to Manchester for the latest. Bloomberg team are on the ground. This is Bloomberg. We should want to win the majority of Americans. But the only way we're going to do that is if we elect a new generational conservative leader. I voted for Donald Trump twice. I was proud to serve America in his administration. But rightly or wrongly, chaos follows him. You know I'm right. Chaos follows him. Showed on time, Donald Trump, Nikki Haley, head to head in the New Hampshire primaries. Polling showing the former president has a commanding lead over the former UN ambassador. Another blowout win for Trump could all but secure this nomination. To New Hampshire we go. Kaylee Lines is on the track. So there's already been a little bit of overnight voting in, what's it called, Little Dixie? I'm learning so much about America, it's killing me. Uh, so where, where, where do we start, Kaylee? Good day. <laughs> 
It's Dixville Notch, man. It's only six votes were cast there roughly around midnight. All six actually went to Nikki Haley, but we're not entirely sure that that's how the rest of the votes in the Granite State are going to go today. Yes, this is a two-person race, what Nikki Haley says she wanted all along. The question is going to be, come tomorrow morning, once all the votes are in, will it still be a two-person race? Because Haley has said New Hampshire, given the large chunk of independent undeclared voters here is her best chance to eat into Trump's lead as the front runner and presumptive Republican nominee. The thing is, she and her team, her surrogates, like Governor Kristen Nunu, have suggested all she really needs is a strong second. The polls suggest that that second may not actually be that strong. Suffolk University and the Boston Globe have a daily tracking poll running. Today, Trump is ahead by 22 points, with 60 percent saying they will vote for him. Only 38 percent will vote for Haley. Now, a large part of this may come down down to turn out the Secretary of State here in New Hampshire, David Scanlon, has said more than 320,000 voters could show up to the polls today, which would be a record for a Republican primary here in the Granite State. And it will likely be a higher turnout vote that strategists think could make more so a break in Haley's favor. Yes, it is warmer here in New Hampshire than it was in Iowa by about 45 degrees. That could play a factor. But it's not just weather. It also is enthusiasm. And data consistently, consistently shows that Trump supporters are for, far more enthusiastic, more energized to get out and vote for him than Haley's supporters are for her. So we have to consider that. And one final note, I would say, Manis, it isn't just the Republicans having a primary today. It's Democratic primary day as well. Incumbent President Joe Biden is not on the ballot as he and the DNC have said South Carolina should be the first primary because of its more diverse voter base. So there is a write-in campaign instead for the president and other candidates in the mix as well, like Congressman Dean Phillips, the Democrat from Minnesota. So there is a question as well to what kind of showing President Biden could put up here in the Granite State today and whether or not that number, if it is low, suggests that he is a weaker candidate as we move forward to what very well could be a general election matchup between him and former President Trump, Manis. Yep, he's banking on the write-ins uh, and, of course, uh the, the right honorable from Minnesota could indeed scoop up a few votes and, and sort of rock the Democratic cradle. Katie, thank you very much. Katie Lyons uh, in Manchester. Mike Zezas and Winnie Caesar are my guests. So here we are. We're careering, in theory, towards a, a, a Trump on the ticket. That's sort of what all the polling is showing. But what was pointed out to me this morning, which was interesting, it's perhaps more important. We're going to deal with the fiscal side. You're both bond uh, at heart, bond and credit investors. So the risk is, the political risk is, not just Trump in the White House, but a Republican Congress, which has a much bigger impact on the fiscal scenario and therefore the bond flow. Mike. Yeah. Yeah, so listen, I think it, it, it's important not just to know which party takes control of the White House, but also Congress. Right. And if you if you have a scenario where one party is in complete control, that opens up a lot of fiscal expansion opportunities. In a scenario where Republicans are in complete control, you could pencil in a decent amount of fiscal expansion by ex, uh, extending expiring tax cuts and jobs act provisions. Mm -hmm. um, that said, there's cross currents even in that situation because there's potential tariff policies on the table. Candidate Trump's talking about a blanket 10 percent tariff. Uh, and there's uncertainty around what it would mean for international commitments for the U.S. Uh, that could snarl supply chains and the like. So I think you could put some expansion on the table in that hypothetical. Mm -hmm. I don't think it's necessarily a straight line to make some strong conclusions of yet anyway about what it would mean for the bond market. OK, so, look, it is still a bit early, and I grant you, you know, you're dealing with slightly more known quantities, both in terms of rhetoric, policy style and ability to execute. Winnie, um, you know, here we are, we're at 412. We could have a very different narrative coming from the Trump campaign if the polls are to be to believe between now and the end of the year. Would that shake the bond market or is it just too soon to get the bond market really to blink? Do we just trade 375 to 325? So we do think that there is some near-term risk to the upside, especially in long-term yields, if the fiscal conversation becomes front and center again, which it clearly was last early August when there was the Fitch rating downgrade. We had Treasury refunding announcements much punchier than expectations. So if we have a return to expecting perhaps a Republican sweep or a Trump as president again, then you might see some loss of confidence again around the fiscal side of things, especially for investors outside of the U.S. And one of the, the big differences in the potential Trump presidential campaign this year 
versus in the past is that yields are objectively higher around the globe, which means that non-U.S. investors have opportunities to put capital to work at pretty enticing yields, not in U.S. treasuries. And that is something that we see as a meaningful short-term risk, as many clients are positioned for yields to remain pretty range-bound in the near term. The one thing I want to close off with both of you, Winnie, let's start with you, which is we simply are not really pricing any kind of a hard landing. There is this narrative, soft landing, 1995, no landing, et cetera. But hard landing, we just finished a conversation with JP Morgan Asset Management. They're ascribing 35% probability to a hard landing. Is it in your cast of characters, or what percentage would you ascribe to a hard landing? Winnie. So we have a hard landing in the 15 to 20% probability range. But I think even more importantly is we have the potential for a stagflation type outcome also in our cast of characters. And that to us is the worst case scenario for fixed income or for US corporate credit, because that means that yields are going to be maybe even higher for even longer than people are anticipating. Right. And you're going to see this rolling default cycle that's going to be much more challenging to manage and much more difficult for the Fed to manage. They don't have necessarily a playbook for stagflation. They do have one for a hard landing. OK, an interesting differential. Mike, let's just finish it off, wrap it up in, 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 in 40 seconds. Uh, the, the hard landing stat for you? Yeah, I mean, soft landing is your base case, but hard landing is probably the next most likely. I mean, right now in our base case, we like develop market government bonds and um, corporate credit. Uh, if hard landing looked like it'd be more likely, we'd obviously need more on government bonds uh, than on credit. Even there, we think IG, corporate credit in the U.S. would probably still do pretty well because you're coming in with relatively clean balance sheets. Uh, but, but certainly... Uh, we'd want to avoid high yield more in that scenario. Okay. Team, thank you very much. That's Mike Zizas and Winnie Caesar on their calls for the markets. And I'll give you uh, a slew of morning calls in just a moment. Holding on to a slightly uh, broader bid to the Russell 2000, the rest of the markets holding on for Netflix and the other tech numbers to come in. Let me give you some of your morning calls uh, that are going to set the agenda. We've got the analyst recommendations. This is what we've got for you. Uh, first up, JP Morgan cutting his recommendation on Coinbase to underweight. Analysts say the enthusiasm around crypto ETFs could deflate. Next up, Chevron getting a downgrade by TD Cohen uh, to market perform. The analyst says that the Hess deal may not contribute to the oil giant's bottom line until 2027. And finally, satellite radio company Cyrus XM is getting a dying grade from Wells Fargo to underweight. The analysts see weak subscription revenue. Coming up on the show, Calvin C. of BNP Paribas discusses why he believes the market is pricing an overly optimistic earnings season. Equity markets quite literally holding on by their fingernails for the hero that are the technology earnings. Uh, look at that. See who's opening the opening bell? There you go. That matters probably more to the sentiment. Uh, there you go, Mr. Johnson. Equity markets are, as I say, trying to trade high. You've got, uh, you got these bond markets uh, debating where they go next in terms of yield. We'll see what Netflix delivers in numbers. They're already doing deals this morning. We'll talk more about that in a moment. Euro dollar, that is down by an eighth of 1%. Ten-year yield straight flat at 4.13.20. Uh, a lot of the juice is already in the equity market and in the bond markets. That is the narrative from our panel of guests this morning. Oil drops by 7 tenths of 1%, 74.25. There is one stock to watch at the open. United, the airline beating on expectations for this year, the outlook, despite the hurdles being presented to them by Boeing. Come fly the friendly skies with Abigail Doolittle and United. I plan to be flying those friendly skies in the not-so-distant future. Manus love to travel. As far as uh, shares of United, they're flying high, too. Excuse the pun. The best day since April of last year. A relief rally in some ways because Delta not so long ago in terms of their quarter, they guided down relative to profits. That's the opposite of what United did, as you just mentioned. So the quarter that just was, they put up earnings of $2 per share, 20% or thereabouts better. They beat on revenues. Relative to the guidance, they gave new guidance for 2024 of $9 
$10 per share to $11 per share. The estimate, the consensus at $9.45. So the midpoint above that, some analysts saying it's very important, especially given all the problems uh, with the max planes, the fact that they were able to maintain and give guidance that could potentially be better than what the street was looking for, that that is really very positive. In general, analysts are positive, saying that this was a strong beat for the end of the year, that guidance seems uh, very solid, and that uh, one analyst in particular over at City, Stephen Trent, saying that this uh, is further evidence that U.S. network airlines, the big airlines, have traded places with the discount carriers. As for the stock performance coming into this, United Airlines underperforming two of those other big airlines, down about 21 percent relative to Delta, down 5 percent, and American Airlines down 16 percent. But probably now, after uh, today's big performance, at least right now, Manus, it's probably trading a little bit more even to American Airlines, but still some work to do to fly positive on the year. Okay, Abby, thank you very much. Let's stick on the earnings one. Johnson & Johnson beat most of the estimates with the medical device sales and pharma revenue driving the profit. Katie Greifeld is with me now. Johnson & Johnson uh, steams ahead. What drove the numbers? Mm -hmm. Well, there was actually a lot of good news here. You take a look at the shares, you're not necessarily seeing that. But to get specific, fourth quarter earnings, they actually beat most expectations. That was thanks in a big part to medical device sales and better than expected pharma revenue. Two areas with plenty of high margin opportunities, which bodes well for Johnson & Johnson. CFO John Wolk also said that uh, Joe Wolk, rather, he said that, quote, large M&A does not scare us and that the company is considering uh, pharma deals. So a lot of movement going on at J&J. &J. Shares currently lower, though, as you can see, by about 2 percent. We'll see how long that lasts, given if you take a look at the sell side, pretty positive on this report. Citi, for example, saying that the strength in the firm's medical devices unit bodes well for peers. You also have J.P. Morgan saying that the numbers highlight healthy underlying trends for J&J's business. So stay tuned, but currently down by more than 2%. Okay, we'll keep an eye on that. Katie, thank you very much. And tune in to our interview with the CFO at 10.40 a.m. Eastern Time. What level of AI overlay can he put into Johnson & Johnson? That might help the stock. Different earnings outcome for Dr. Horton, the home builder, reporting weaker than expected quarterly orders amid high rates. Natalia uh, Kanijevich joins me now with more detail. Down 4.43%, so a bit of pressure there. That's right, Mana. So quarterly earnings came up 35 percent. That sounds year over year. That sounds like a lot, but it was an easy comparison and the number came below expectations. EPS also disappointed. But at the same time, the U.S. home builder was very optimistic about this upcoming selling season this spring. They also slightly increased forecast revenue for the full year. So 2023 was a very challenging year for the U.S. housing markets. Uh, rates uh, were elevated and and it's pretty much understandable because who wants to buy a new house when mortgage rate was about 8% and if you bought it, especially during the pandemic, when rates were at 2%. So now mortgage rates are coming down. Big U.S. home builders are using incentives. They have an opportunity to provide lower uh, rates for customers, somewhere around 5%, and it helps them a lot. So as mortgage rates moving down, we see this increase in U.S. home building sentiment. In January, it spiked by the most this uh, uh, by the most in nearly a year, and we see that. It's still actually slightly below pre-pandemic levels. During the earnings call, the company also said that they will continue using incentives and they are ready to reduce prices for homes and also uh, reduce square footage when necessary just to boost sales. There you go. Trying to get those uh, houses off their lot. Of course, it's Dior Horton, not Dr. Horton. Irish humor doesn't go a long way in New York, does it? Natalia, thank you very much. Another earnings number for us to keep an eye on. Procter & Gamble, the consumer goods company, missing the estimates as volume continues to slip. So where was the slippage? Simone Foxman can give us the details. Stock 5.5% uh, higher, Simone. So talk us through it. Yeah, there were some mixed messages here, but uh, the uh, analyst class clearly reading the positive ones, and that's why we're seeing shares up well over 5% this morning. This is the maker of Bounty Paper Towels, Downy Fabric Softener. Saw that organic revenue miss. That was where we saw some pressure. Beauty sales up 1%. Everyone had expected that they would be up 3.8%. Baby and family care also falling short of estimates, and the company complaining of a slower-than-expected recovery in China. 
all of this weighing on overall sales. Overall net sales, 21.4 billion. The expectation had been 21.6. That said, the positivity here, all because the profits were really okay. They were still able to boost prices 4% year on year. Margins uh, significantly better than expected. And their profit outlook for the full year ending June 30, that was also on the high end of estimates. They'd been talking about 6 to 9% growth, now saying they're gonna see 8 to 9% uh, EPS growth, even even though their sales are going to be on the lower side of expectations. For retailers broadly, we're seeing them try to play off a wary consumer that's overall spending less with um, juicing their margins and overall delivering higher profits. That was what's happening here. Bloomberg Intelligence saying this profit beat easing commodity costs and improved volume trends. All of those things are underpinning their confidence on the company achieving its guidance. City also saying these were solid results and that optimism being reflected in early trading menace. Okay, Simone, thank you very much. Simone Foxman there. Uh, let's turn to our guest now. It is Calvin C. at BNP Barrett about weighing in on earnings. He gave it to another newspaper, but we won't hold that against him. Here we go. The market is looking for reacceleration in earnings growth to 12% this year from 3% last Last year, and this looks a little bit too optimistic in the environment where we expect growth to slow. Calvin, good morning to you. So I've been saying all morning, I'm sort of channeling a song from the 1980s. We're holding on for the hero that is the earnings, specifically from tech, really to give us a little bit more alpha. You are doubtful. Why are you, why are you committing this crime of doubt? Sure, thanks for having me, Manis. Our main message is that we think the markets are too optimistic for this year. If we look across asset classes, including in equities, it looks like the markets are perfect, perfectly priced for a soft landing in the United States. We expect that landing to be a bit bumpier. We're expecting growth to essentially be flat in the first quarter, looking for a small contraction in the second quarter. And that is an environment that we think is going to be quite difficult for the markets to meet their earnings expectations, as you said. The markets are looking for an acceleration of earnings this year from 3% to 12%, which we find hard to see in an environment where growth is slowing. Now, you did say to another newspaper, despite all the enthusiasm that we've seen in stocks right now, we're inclined to go the other way. Now, what does that mean? Does that mean de-risk? Does it mean short? Does it mean hesitancy? Translate for me. Sure. There are different ways that we like uh, protecting the downside. One is uh, options at the moment are quite cheap, so we like buying downside protection. As well, uh, there are certain pockets of the market we think that um, make overwriting strategies look quite attractive. Uh, in other words, uh, if you cannot uh, go short the market, uh, you could own your stocks, but at the same time sell uh, topside calls, and that allows you to collect some premium, earn some income, while at the same time uh, being in the market. Again, as we don't expect the markets to trade significantly higher from here, we think those kinds of strategies make a lot of sense for investors who need to stay invested in the market. And to a certain extent, uh, we're having a debate this morning and every morning about the timing and the type of of rate cuts that come. So this morning so far, I've had, we're going to get insurance rate cuts from the Fed, and maybe that's two cuts. And then the window closes as of Labor Day for them. Does that sound about a base case for you? Because you're quite bearish in terms of the number of cuts and the timing. That does not really resonate with our own views. Our own view is that the Fed starts its cutting cycle in May of this mm -hmm. year. They cut 25 basis points that meeting, and they cut 25 basis points for every meeting for the rest of the year. So we're looking for 150 basis points of cuts this year. And while that may seem a lot, the Fed is only forecasting three rate cuts for this year. We don't think it's that extreme, especially when we're thinking about policy in real terms rather than nominal terms. We're expecting quite significant deceleration in inflation this year. And as that occurs, the rate cutting regime that we envision basically keeps real rates steady. In other words, it's not adding a ton of accommodation into the market, but if the Fed didn't cut consistently, we think, in the back half of this year, it would push real rates higher, which would actually tighten conditions, which is something that the Fed probably wants to avoid in a scenario, again, where we see growth slowing down this year. So if that's your view in terms of rate cuts beginning in May, we go one each uh, e each meeting then. How do you think this plays out then for the curve? Because that is a series of rate cuts not predicated on any massive implosion in growth, I'm presuming. 
uh, it's the fabled soft landing and, and behavior and inflation. How do you see the curve reflecting then? Sure. So for this year, we don't think the markets are that mispriced. We're forecasting 150 basis points of cuts. The markets are forecasting about 135. So we're not too far off. We're, I think the best opportunity on the curve lies is not for 2024 pricing, but where the markets have priced for the end point. In other words, the terminal level of cutting. And what's really interesting to me is that the markets have pulled forward rate cuts quite aggressively over the last few months into this year. But that end point has been pretty steady. And we're currently around 3.35%. And we've been hovering in that 3 and a quarter to 3 and a half range for quite some time. That's another sign to me in the rates market that the markets are, again, very optimistic because the Fed's view of where neutral policy setting is, rates that are neither restrictive nor easy, is at 2.5%. So the market's expecting the Fed to end close to 35 mm -hmm. suggests that in the rates market as well, the markets are looking for a very soft landing. We expect that landing to be a little bumpier than the markets expect, which is why our own forecast is that the Fed ends its cutting cycle at 2.75%. Therefore, because of that, we like positioning in the belly of the curve, and we like steepeners looking for five-year to outperform the 10-year. Yeah, and this is a building narrative, not just now, but certainly before Christmas and onwards, which has been, you know, go for the belly of the curve. Um, I look at risk, and to a certain extent, the, the, there's this a, a phrase that we had over Christmas time, this weaponized FOMO. Um, and, and to a certain extent, I want to get a sense from you. Do you think that these markets look as if they're being careless or reckless in any way in how they're pricing equity risk? I wouldn't say the markets are careless or reckless. What I would say is that the markets um, are optimistic. And the markets are very positioned in a way that um, is quite different from last year, where last year positioning mm -hmm. was light, uh, earnings expectations were weaker, especially as everyone was looking for a recession, um, while at the same time protection was well bid. This year, basically everything's flipped on its head, where positioning is now long. We think that earnings expectations are too lofty, <laughs> while at the same time that reach for protection isn't there. So an indicator that we look at is skew in the S&P 500, the cost of puts relative to calls. That's at a historically low level, suggesting that investors are not looking for that protection. And this overly optimistic market environment, we think, is one that suggests room for correction lower. OK. Uh, and, and that, if we scale back a little bit on that, maybe all those, uh, those hedges, as you say, uh, will work if you write the calls out of the money calls and maybe pick up a little bit of uh, cheap volatility. Calvin, let's see how it plays out. Uh, Calvin C, BNP Paribas, my guest this morning on Markets. Netflix will deliver their numbers, kicking off the big tech earnings after the close. They will still continue to deliver growth, of course, supported by these structural tailwind, that is artificial intelligence. Big Tech Better Deliver on Bloomberg. last year, but in the past five years, right, the uh, competitive annual growth rates of these mega cap tech companies has been great, you know, ranging from 15% to uh, even 30% for the EPS growth. So I do think that this earnings uh, expectation is likely to be justified. They will still continue to deliver growth, of course, supported by these structural tailwind, that is artificial intelligence. Jenna Mew there of RBC Bruin Dolphin giving her outlook for the tech earnings season that's really going to kick into high gear. Netflix brings the bacon home today, getting a boost after announcing they're going to pair up with WWE for the first big move into live events. Netflix are paying $5 billion for the exclusive rights to wrestling content. And there's potentially more good news on the way. The analysts expect Netflix to beat its own forecast for subscriber growth when they report after the bell. Geetha uh, Raganatham joins me now. So we caught up a little bit earlier and you've got some pretty punchy numbers uh, penciled in for subscriber growth. Let's start there. Yeah, absolutely. So, you know, expectations going into the fourth quarter, Manus, are pretty high. This is a seasonally strong quarter, good, solid content lineup. And of course, they have their two big initiatives, which have been in play through most of this year. 
One is, of course, the new advertising tier, which is you know much more economically priced. And the other one is the password uh, sharing crackdown. And both of those initiatives are not only expected to yield new subscribers, but going into 2024, it's going to be about how they uh, play up the revenue reacceleration story. Uh, and you brought up an excellent point with the raw deal, because that really goes, that really speaks to their scale or, or the ambitions that they have for their advertising business. Live wrestling. There was a there was a huge cheer went up in the newsroom uh, every two weeks. There, uh, that that's it. Wrestling reigns in the New York newsroom. Geetha, thank you very much, Geetha Raghunatham. There, Bloomberg Intelligence will bring you those Netflix numbers, uh, of course. And let's stick with the deal. The WWE Nick Khan, WWE president, joins us in the next hour. So that's going to be a fascinating insight. Ed Ludlow is standing by in terms of what else we've got in the pipeline of Bloomberg Technology. So I said it at night. 9 a.m. I'll say it again. Uh, you know, we are holding on for the hero, Ed, that is technology. Yeah, I think that the big theme for the earnings season is that the Magnificent Seven is still going to account for the large bulk of EPS growth for the S&P 500, for example. Um, but this week, we kind of start in earnest. The chip sector is really important to watch. Texas Instruments is a maker of very basic chips. They go into very many end markets. But they also are seeing shrinking bottom line because uh, many customers have been working through a buildup in inventories. And then you look at Intel later in the week, the first time that they're due to report both revenue and profit growth in the post-pandemic era. But the thing they both have in common is the outlook for, the 20, for 2024. TSMC's capital spending plans for this year they're the biggest contract manufacturer of chips, made us confident. Um, and then go back to the Magnificent Seven. Tesla is first up this week. You know, record quarterly sales expected. But again, look to the bottom line. That seems to be where we're going to be most focused because they had to heavily discount and incentivize in the final three months of the year with analysts expecting a drop in EPS, excuse me, of about 39%. Um, and Tesla has this target of 50% annual growth, which means that... They should guide us towards 2.7 million EVs in 2024. The street thinks they'll guide to 2.2. Um, but the broader story with EVs has been that we will still have growth in global sales this year, just not the growth we expected. And of course, being the market incumbent and the leading pure play in EV, Tesla is the best barometer of that. So buckle up, Manus. It's an exciting week. They let me out of my box and I'll do my thing. <laughs> <laughs> and you'll do it very well. Ed, thank you very much. Bloomberg Technologies, Ed Ludlow there. Calvin C is with me, BNP Paribas, for his final thought. You know, there is this view, buy strong tech with balance sheets. They earn money in a rising uh, rate environment. Here we are going into a cutting rate environment. Will that embolden the growth to value narrative? Thanks, Manis. A lot of the equity rally that we've seen over the last few months <clears throat> has in large part been been because of the macro environment. And what I mean by that is we've seen a large rally in rates over the last few months. And that large rally in rates has meant essentially that these earnings in the equities market has been discounted back at a lower level. What's notable, though, is the driver of the rates rally. And the driver of the rates rally has largely been improving inflation. Mm -hmm. So inflation lower, rates lower, the equity markets love that. Going forward, however, we think that significantly lower rates from here, uh -huh. the driver is going to change. And with the markets already pricing the Fed to cut essentially at 25 basis points a meeting for the year, for rates to go lower, we need the markets to be pricing 50 basis points a meeting. And we think a necessary prerequisite for the markets to get there is that growth needs to weaken quite significantly. So the main message here is that lower rates from here, we don't think is necessarily going to be that equity market supportive because the driver is likely to change. Okay, Let, let's see uh, how the year pans out. It's still, you know, it's still fresh in the year. Nobody really uh, has that crystal ball. Calvin, thank you very much. Calvin C. Uh, on the markets right here on Bloomberg. bid for breadth this morning. Russell up a half of 1%. 80% of the companies that have reported in America for the fourth quarter, they've beaten in terms of profits. That's the note hot off the UBS uh, scribe from Salita Marcelli. 
Let me get you up to date with your trading diary. This is what you're going to watch for the rest of the week. Today, it is all about politics, New Hampshire primary, plus Netflix. We've banged that drum several times. We'll get those numbers. Wednesday, it is more tech earnings, Tesla and IBM. What are the price cuts of Tesla? Thursday, it is macro monetary policy. ECB is on the block, and we will get a read on the growth story in the United States for the GDP. American Express hits the tape on Friday. Equity markets at the moment are bid. This is about banking uh, on earnings from Netflix, from Tesla. Equity markets are bid up. That was count down to the open. Thanks for joining us on Bloomberg.